do you think that you're going to go and you're going to go and have these sexual affairs with a married woman? And I I don't know whether David was married. Now, I'm talking about David and Bathsheba now. And you're going to go and have these affairs and your, your hormones don't went up. You know, you, you feel like you got to get this thing going on now. Now it's all done and finished. Everybody know y'all been in that sexual manner before and you be all on the rush and you be all on the top of the clouds. And when it's all done, it's just so crazy how the body generates back to the normal heartbeat, generates back to the normal feelings. And now the truth of the matter starts to come out. That's why a lot of people after they have sexual intercourse with a woman or a man, they don't want to be bothered with no more because it was just a sexual arousal. And that's what happened with David. So now, go on, go on. You, you went on and you done had your, you done, you done had a little thing. Now I'm going to send, oh, Uriah is, is drunk. Let me send him on home and the baby will be his. Uh -huh. God said, really? You think this is going to be swept underneath the rug? You think I'm going to prove of this? No, I won't. No, you think you're going to get away with this? I'm going to get You think you're going to get away with this? Oh, no, you're not. No, you're not. And that's how people is today. They do the little dirt in the corner and they think God don't see them. And then sometimes they don't even do the dirt in the corner. They do the dirt right in the face. People see them, but they be thinking God don't see them. Oh, I can get away with it with the people so I can get away with it with God. And next thing you know, years later, what you done did come and hit you in your face. And then now you want to blame every Tom, Dick, and Harry for your sin that you did. But you the one who punished him from it. Not the one who opened up their mouth and said something about it. So here David trying to be sick about it. So he said, all right, this is what I'm going to do. We're going to put Uriah. We're going to send Uriah on over there. And we're going to let Uriah go and, and, and have his little thing with his wife. And then that's going to be it. I'm a, David's like, I'm going to be off the hook. As I said, God said, no, you're not. You ain't getting off the hook with this. Because you bringing me to a shame. See, it's not all right to sin. It's not all right to sin, right? But when you do sin that really deprives God, abomination to God, right? What really, I mean, what really, what God really, uh, how can I put it up? What God really puts out there to not do, and you feel like I'm going to do it anyway because I belong to God, or ah, because nobody don't see this, and I guess they be thinking, not even God. So I can go on and I can do all of this and get away with it. So that's what David thought. So once... He woke up the next morning and he realized that Uriah was still there. He had to come up with another plan. Because now Uriah is sober now. So he going, Uriah going to remember that night. Right? Because I, be, I don't believe Bathsheba would have been lying to him or would have lied to him. And if you notice, the story doesn't tell us nothing about Bathsheba. The story tells us about David. Bathsheba did what she did. And she went and was obedient. Even though she had sub she had to suffer the consequences from losing a son. But God ain't bringing no... People, that, people, people love to use the term, oh, out of wedlock. Oh, that's a bastard child. So I don't want to be bothered with him. Right? Yeah. But God still... Still, even though she, he got rid of Bathsheba's first child, Bathsheba and David's first child, he still allowed them to have a child. And he used that child because of the lineage of who and where his son was coming through. So that line had to stay pure. So whoever Uriah was, let's think about it. Maybe Uriah line was not pure. It could not be mixed up in the line of 
David of where Jesus was going to come through. So he went on. So he had to get rid of that child. He didn't get rid of Bathsheba. Well, not even Uriah, because Uriah, that way, I, I got it wrong. You, that wasn't Uriah's child, so no. So the he had to keep, he had to get rid of the child because it was wrong to do. His commandments say he knew his commandments was going to come, even if the, I don't, was the commandment done then? Yeah, I, I don't know. In my mind, I don't really know. But let's just say the commandment wasn't put in the place about thou shalt not commit adultery. Or uh, let's say the, the it was okay. Thou shalt let's put it. It's not in play yet that thou shalt not commit adultery. So now you go on and David does that committing adultery, and now it's in the word that David child out of adultery survived. Then it wouldn't look right. Now it's being done today. Children are, are surviving adulteries, uh, uh, mishaps, right? And God is using them, right? Because I'm one of them. <laughs> so, uh, 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 God has, we're no longer under law, we're under grace. So, God has perfected. He said, I haven't come to destroy the law, I came to fulfill it. So, he's fulfilling that perspective. So, I'm going to leave that alone. I'm not going to go deep into that because I don't want nobody getting the wrong thought that it's all right to commit adultery because it's not. All right, so. So once he found out that Uriah was alive, him and the devil... The devil in him came up with another plan, which was to kill him. Now, that's crazy. And that's how life is today. People want, of course, a man or a woman that they want or love or whatever the case may be. Or some woman or man want to leave. And next thing you know, they being gunned down because you're not leaving me or, or you're messing around with somebody else. So I'm about to do you in or something like that, right? I love these folks. They give me the 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 feeling of realness. Okay. So let's finish this story. I got some work to do. I was talking to my son and we was talking about. We got into the conversation of this. And so I was telling them the story and how people think about David and they always want to blame Bathsheba. And was saying that, oh, in other words, she was being a Jezebel. Now, a lot of people want to judge based on their own experience, maybe with their wives or their husband. But don't put your experience in the experience of, of biblical terms because of the simple fact it, it ain't there, you know? Oh, my legs hurt. Hang on, hang on. I got, to, uh, I got to unravel my leg. Woo, child. Okay. Mm. Okay, let me just turn that down. Okay, so we're going to put this underneath my leg. Whew. All right. Okay, so let's finish this. So now, God's good and God's good. And thanks for my food by him. Must be thank you, God. So now. So now. He killed a man. He told the head person, the commanding officer, to put Uriah, Uriah, at the at the front line. So there was no way he could miss the arrows. Lord have mercy. Just think of it was 
the guns. So, once that went down, the Lord stepped in. And he sent the, uh, he sent the, uh, um, He sent Jonathan. If I'm correct, it was Jonathan. Hello. Okay, so it's Samuel. Okay, so let me read. And David sent and inquired. And it came to pass in the evening time that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself, and the woman was very beautiful to look upon. So we know what the beautiful is. It's not so much as her face was looking beautiful. You notice that it says she was washing herself. No. Excuse me. So that means he saw her whole body. So he did know who Bathsheba was. And David sent and inquired after the woman. Oh, no, no, no. Okay, it so says David sent and inquired after the woman. And one said, is not this Bathsheba the daughter of Elam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Okay, let me see. We have some footnotes that say, As David looked from the roof of the palace, he saw a beautiful woman bathing, and he was filled with lust. David should have left the roof and fled, fled the temptation. Instead, he entertained the temptation by inquiring about Bathsheba. The results was devastating. Okay, and David sent messengers and took her, and she came in unto him, and he laid with her, for she was purified from her uncleanliness, and she returned unto her house. So that means purified from her uncleanliness. That means that she no longer had her period, right? So therefore, she conceived. So just like I was saying to my son that apparently... It was time for her, her menstrual cycle, right? When they did it, she wasn't having it. She was clean and pure. But then she conceived. So they say for a woman seven days before her menstrual cycle, and seven days after her menstrual cycle, she can get pregnant. That's what they call ob oblivation. Oblivation. It's due to those times that the women be paying attention of when they can have, when they conceive. Because they only can conceive during the time of menstrual cycle because that's when the egg can be fertilized. Now we we hold them eggs we hold we hold them eggs in our body for twenty eight days of every month. Three hundred and sixty five days a year. Twenty eight, twenty two, however long it takes for a woman to get her cycle, her menstrual cycle. That's how long she hold them eggs. But after a while them eggs gotta release, be released. They gotta get out of you. Because you're not going to hold on to them eggs 70 years old. You ain't going to have no eggs up in you. you. The body has to release all of that. Get rid of that. That's how God made the body. 
So she was she was going through her ovulation, ovulation, whatever you call it. Let me get that word right. And so she conceived. And she and sent and told David and said, I am a child. Oh, so I left this part out. He went and told Joab to send for Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. And when Uriah was come unto him, David demanded of him how Jahab did and how the people did and how the war prospered. So he was having a normal conversation when he had some double men up his sleeve. Right? And David said to Uriah, go down to thy house and wash thy feet. And Uriah departed out of the king's house and there followed him a mess of meat from the king. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord and went not down to the house. So I said that he was drunk, but he wasn't drunk. My mistake. That's why I want to read the word because I don't want to be telling no, no, no lies to you, my subscribers. So it doesn't say here that they drank. It says that David said to Uriah to go down to thy house and wash thy feet. So it seemed like he was sending him to his house. His plans was to sleep with his wife. Plans was to send Uriah home so Uriah can go and sleep with the with the wife. But that's not what happened. Instead, he slept at the door. The ninth verse said, But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord and went not down to his house. Now, I think this is why I, I say he was drunk. So, and when they had told David, saying, Uriah went not down into his house, David said unto Uriah, Camest thou not from thy journey? Why then didst thou not go down into the house? And this is what Uriah said. And Uriah said unto David, The ark, and Israel and Judah abide in tents and my Lord Joab and the servants of my Lord are encamped in the open fields. Oh, this is why they have nothing to do with Trump. Shall I then go into mine house uh, to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife? So that that's what it was about. Thank you, Holy Ghost, for letting me read this so I can really know how the story went. So he wasn't drunk. And David was not sending him home since he was drunk, drunk to lie with his wife. David was sending him home to get drunk, to like, let me see, how can I say it? That's why he said, that's why David said to him, come as thou not from thy journey, when then didst thou not go down into thine house? So he's saying to him, you had this long journey, Y'all had the war, y'all had the fighting, and you won. So normally, I guess back in those days, when they win a war, they come back and celebrate. So that's what David, why David was sending him. So you go home, you celebrate, and you get, get drunk, and then you lie with the wife. So that's what he said. My, he said, and the servants of my Lord, which is David, are encamped in the open fields. They ain't, they not in no house or nothing. Okay. He said the ark and Israel and Judah and Judah abide in tents. They're all perfectly protected. Got a place to stay, whatever, right? He said, and my Lord Joab, oh, that, that he's the one. So I guess my Lord is in reference to, not the king, is in reference to, the commander over the the soldiers. They are encamped in open fields. Shall I then go in mine house? Because everybody else, they probably fight from far and near. So when they come back home, it's more home to where David is and where Uriah live. Right? Maybe some others live, but I guess some of them the servants don't live where they live at. So they got to camp outside. So because he's home, he's saying, because I'm home, am I supposed to go 
in my house and, and drink and lie with my wife? He said, as thou liveth and as thy soul liveth, I will not do that thing. So he was genuinely true to that. He said, I'm not going to do all that. He was, and, and my, the servants and all that stuff is out there. They, they ain't got nobody to lie with. They ain't got no, no place to go and all this stuff is all up to us. Okay. So now, that didn't go as David planned. So he said, but he plays it off. Mm -mm. I got a hold to a shell. Hey, shells in my ears. Okay. Okay. And David said to Uriah, Tarry here today also and tomorrow, and I will let thee depart. So Uriah board in Jerusalem that day and tomorrow. Okay. And when David had called him, he did eat and drink before him and made him drunk. And at even he went out to lie on his bed with the servants of the Lord, but went not down to the house. So I was right. David did get him drunk. So he was still trying. The first thing he tried, the first the first way he tried by telling him to go on down there. Like I hate when I ain't got no water near me. Shoot. I usually keep water down by me. I got to take this pill with water. Oh, this hair just flying all over the place. Okay, so let me go on. I'll just take... I'll take this one. I never took it with anything else because the directions is to take it with water. Okay. So, so he did get him drunk, and he made him drunk. And that even at evening, at even he went out to lie on his bed with the servants of his lord, but went not down to his house. So he still didn't go. Even after he got him drunk, he still stayed where um where David was at. Okay, now I say David arranges for Uriah's death. And it came to pass in the morning. This is still 2 Samuel 11. I'm at the 14th verse. And it came to pass in the morning that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by hand of Uriah. That's jacked up. He wrote the death plate for the man, and the man carried his own destiny in his hand. He didn't have no idea that David wrote in there for him to be killed. But he, David wrote it, gave it to him, and he went and delivered it. And because it was the king, Joab had no other choice. And he wrote in the letter saying, Set ye Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle. And retire ye from him that he may be smitten and die. David, 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 King David, man at the God's own heart, what are you doing? And it came to pass when Joab observed the city that he assigned Uriah into a place where he knew that villain men was, the men that would big men that kill you dead and the men of the city went out and fought with Joab 
And there fell some of the people of the servants of David, and Uriah the Hittite died also. Then Joab sent and told David all the things concerning the war, and charged the messenger, saying, When thou hast made an end of telling the matter of the war unto the king, and if so be that the king's wrath arise, and he say unto thee, Wherefore approach ye so nigh unto the city when ye did fight? Knew ye not that they would shoot him? Shoot. Knew ye not that they would shoot from the wall? Who smote, who smote Amalek, the son of Jerabasheth? Did not a woman cast a piece of millstone upon him from the wall that he died in Tibes? Why went ye nigh the wall? Then say thou, thy servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. Why well, look at him. He's telling him what to say. So the messenger went and came and shoot David all that Joab had sent him for. And the messenger said unto David, Surely the men prevail against us and came out unto us into the field. And we were upon them even unto the en entering of the gate. And the shooters shot from off the wall upon thy servants. And some of the king's servants be dead. And thy servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. Then David said unto the messenger, Thus shalt thou say unto Joab, Let not this thing displease thee, for the sword devoured one as well as another. See, he telling her not he telling him not to even grieve for the man. For the sword devoured one as well as another. Make thy battle more strong against the city, and overthrow it, and encourage thou him. He telling him what to do. Just go ahead, get Get your battle more strong. Get your people more. Just get more people up and go on and fight. He ain't even have no remorse for the for the guy. Lord, she, that's how people live today. You see how things just carry on? Y'all think it's something new happening with these people killing it. And, and you wonder, how could they just kill somebody like that? The same way David did. And when the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she moaned for her husband. I guess, yeah. Not even knowing that the man she pregnant by did it. The king at that. And when the morning was past, look, David let her mourn. Devilish. David sent and fetched her to his house. And she became his wife and bared him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. Wait a minute. They said, hold up, hold up, hold up. I'm kind of lost here. Fetched her to his house. And she became his wife and bared him a son. So you would think that they had intercourse and she got pregnant by him again. But... If I'm correct, this is the this is the same baby. Okay, so we got we now Second Samuel twelve Nathan. That's right. So I was right. It was Nathan. And the Lord sent Nathan unto David. This is where I say people be thinking they're getting away with stuff. Nathan wasn't there. This is why people don't want to accept people for prophets. And God start perceiving their lives and, and telling them about they self. When they know for a fact that they didn't tell the person nothing. But the person is telling them about their life. And what's going to happen to them. They don't, they, they don't want to hear them. Oh, there ain't no prophet. Everybody want to be a prophet. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> you ain't got to listen. You ain't got to listen. But you better be like David Like David was. Let me read and let you see what David did. And the Lord sent Nathan unto David, and he came unto him and said unto him, There were two men. So this is why I say, when God sent you to do a job, he going to send you to do that job. He ain't going to have you fraternizing with nobody. He ain't going to have you becoming friends with nobody. He ain't going to have you getting no ranks. <laughs> if he sent you to do something, you're going to go in there and do it and go about your business. Just, just, 
I don't even want to go. I don't, don't want to get too deep. I want to get too. I want to stay focused so y'all can get this story. But I, I just had to put that there because people saying, "Oh, God sent me to. I'm supposed to do this and I'm supposed to do that." So when you gonna do it? God sent you to go and tell Johnny May to stop messing around with Johnny Sue. But before you tell Johnny May what not to do, before you deliver God's message, you want to be friends with Johnny May. God didn't tell you to be friends with him. Oh, let me let me get to know about her or him. Let me let me let me find some stuff on him. So when I'm ready to 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 get what I want, not do what God say do. When I'm ready to get what I want, then I can use that to get it. So now you all friends with Johnny May. But God tell, told you to go there to tell Johnny May to leave Johnny Sue alone. Now all this time, you're holding up God's plan. Right? Because there's a result to it. There's a reason why he's telling you to tell Johnny May to leave Johnny Sue alone. Maybe because he won. Now, he done told you the result of it. Because he want to make Johnny May, uh, 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 send Johnny May over to Paris to open up a church. But Johnny May got to get right and leave Johnny Sue alone. But you don't want that to happen. You don't You don't want Johnny May to, to, to get this, this, to go to Paris because you always wanted to go. <laughs> so I ain't telling that one. I'm going to get friends with Johnny. I'm going to become friends with Johnny May so that when they, when, when God sent him to Paris, I'll be able to go. So I got to act like I'm Johnny May's friend, even though God didn't tell me to come be friends with Johnny May. Okay. So I'm saying that because Nathan went and did what God said do. Said what God said. He said, and the Lord sent Nathan unto to David. That's the key, being sent. A lot of people going some places and God ain't sent them nowhere. He said, how, how what did he say? How you going to preach without being sent? God got to send you to preach. Okay, I'm going. And he came unto him and said unto him, there were two men in one city. You see how God can tell, get you to tell a little story here, right? Two men in one city. The one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceedingly many flocks and herb, herbs. But the poor man had nothing save one little ear lamb. But she had brought and nourished up. And it grew up together with him. And with his children. It did eat of his own meat. And drank of his own cup. And laid in his bosom. And was unto him as a daughter. And then came a traveler. Unto the rich man. And he spared to take. Of his own flock. And of his own herb. To dress for the wayfaring man. That was come unto him. But took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man that was come to him. So now, instead of him using his own lambs, he had so many. He went and got the poor man's lamb and killed it. And used it to feed the traveling man that came to him. And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man and said to Nathan, as the Lord, as the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. And Nathan said to David, thou art the man. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel, 
and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul. You see what I'm saying? When God sends a messenger to message his message, it comes very powerful. And this is what God said through Nathan to David. Letting David see that God did not forget what he did for David, but David forgot. So God sometimes have to remind us where he brought you from. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king of Israel. The age of 13, 15, something like that. And I delivered thee out of the, out of the hand of Saul. Saul was set out to kill him. Go read, read it. You can read it. Saul was trying to kill him. And I gave thee thy master's house and thy master's wives into thy bosom and gave thee the house of Israel and of Judea. And if thou had been too little, I would moreover have given unto thee such and such things. If you didn't have nothing, if you had just a little bit, I would have gave you this, that, and the other. Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou shalt not kill. That's the commandment he's talking about. Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword and hast taken his wife to be thy wife. You see how cruel people is? They sit there and plan what they're going to take from you, but they're going to get you out of the way. That's why I got no problem. They got me out of the way to take whatever they wanted to take from me. But it doesn't really matter because God got something bigger and better for me. Now, it may not look like I ain't doing nothing. It may not look like I ain't going nowhere because they don't see me. It may even look like to them that I ain't saved. But God is working it out for my good. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Okay. Now, therefore, wait, has taken his wife to be thy wife and has slain him with the sword of the children of Am Ammon. Now, therefore, the sword shall never. That was scary. Child, I would have been like, Nathan, what, what I need to do? You use the word never. God is never. This is a God word. The sword shall never depart from thine house. Because thou hast despised me and hast taken the wife of Uriah, the Hittite, to be thy wife. See, that's what made him, that's what made God angry. Sin is sin, yes it is. But I, I don't I don't know, it may not be it may to you it may not sound right to say, but there's just some sin, there's just some sins God don't play with. You can there's there's sins that people can do over and over again and 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 it doesn't affect them. Yes, they gotta pay the consequences in due time. And they may live years and it, it never affect them. But then there's some sins that they do, they get paid for right away. And and I feel, this is just my feeling, I feel that's because that particular sin is trying, that person is using it to degrade God like committing adultery that 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 is totally against God uh 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 homosexuality is totally against God cross dressing is totally against God wearing things that pertain to a man to be a man or wearing things that pertain to a woman to be a woman when you're a man or, or wearing things that pertain to a man when you're a woman, to be a man is totally against God. So these are sins that when the punishment comes, it's going to come real strong compared to you just stealing because the Lord take care of you stealing. You keep on stealing, the Lord going to catch up with you. As people call karma, the Lord is going to catch up with you. The Lord is going to catch up with you. And then you're going to have to suffer the consequence of that sin. Because biblically, that is a commandment. Thou shalt not steal. So it may seem like people may be getting away with things. And then again, on the flip side, it may seem like, oh, that person really suffered for that. Why they suffer so bad when that person over there is doing the same thing? 
Sometimes God use people for example to let you see you don't play with me. Don't play with me. I say you ain't got no business killing, killing, and you out there killing. Now I don't care how many people done kill. I don't care how many people in jail that done did a murder. You ain't gonna do it. You know. So here David thought he was gonna get away with committing two. He committed two commandments. He broke two commandments. Thou shalt not kill and thou shalt not commit adultery. He just, he just knew he was getting away with it. Okay. So because of that, because he killed Uriah, the sword shall never depart from his house. Every time he turned around, somebody was going to be getting killed, either in his house, or somebody connected to him. So it don't necessarily mean it had to be his his immediate family. Anybody on the outside that's connected to him. Okay. And that's because he despised God and take the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. Thus saith the Lord, God ain't finished. Let's listen here. What else is that? Behold, I will raise up, I will rise up evil against thee out of thy own house. Look at that. Right in the house, David had to suffer. When you read on, this is 2 Samuel 12. When you read on, you'll see where David had to run from his own son. Jerolamon, I think that was his name. I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house, and I will take thy wives before thine eyes. People, going, people came in there and took his wives from him. He was left with nothing. And give them unto thy neighbor. And he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of this son, Lord Jesus. Now, David did it secretly and did it behind Uriah's back. Do you see how God does things? You want to be in the corner messing around with somebody. You you may want to be and may do it in front of your wife, but it's still on a DL because wifey is keeping it secret and making it seem like y'all been friends all along and this is cool. But what God going to do, God going to flip the strip and allow somebody to mess with your wife right in front of your face, in front of everybody's face, sleep with your wife, do whatever, make some kids with your wife. And even though you was doing what you was doing with another woman in front of your wife, you wasn't even thinking about doing all that. You just was doing that in front of your wife. You just was flirting with the woman in front of your wife. But God going to let somebody come mess around with your wife, take your wife from you. Lord, Jesus, who wants to mess with a God like that? Right? And it's saying he shall, and then going to give it to your neighbor. It ain't going to be nobody that you don't know. It's going to be somebody that you know, you see, probably raised up with your neighbor. Right? And, and the Bible says, who's your neighbor? Whoever that you encounter. Come in contact with. And they and he shall lie with thy wives. You see how God said it? We call it intercourse. We call it sexual intercourse. They call it lie with. So that means... That whoever come in there, whoever God allowed to come in there, they're going to come and take Bathsheba and whatever other wives you got and lie with him. Because you thought because you was king, you could get away with your foolishness. You thought because you a pastor, you could get away with it. You could do whatever. I, oh, I could do whatever I want because I'm a pastor and everybody going to do what I say. Oh, because I'm a bishop, I can say whatever I want, do what I want, act however I want, because I'm the bishop. People go, and, I, and then when I get up there, you better do what I say. Oh, because I'm an evangelist, you're going to do this, because I'm an elder. Uh-uh. God has no respect to person. 
sin is sin and wrong is wrong. And when you start breaking his commandments, you think you are right by breaking his commandments? For thou didst, just what I said, you in the corner. Even though you in front of somebody flirting with another woman in front of your wife and maybe in your house on the phone with somebody and your wife is sitting there knowing what's going on. You doing all that secretly, but look what God said. You, David did it secretly. Nobody knew David went and slept with uh, uh, Bathsheba. Nobody knew, but Joe, no, I don't even think, yeah, but Joab, he's the only one that knew. He the only one knew that David set up to kill Hariah, Uriah. Everybody else just figured David got killed, in, uh, David got killed, that Uriah got killed in the war. Excuse me. No, I didn't even know that David told Uriah through, David told Joab, Joab, right? In front, I mean, David told, I'm so excited, relax, my brain is running faster than my mouth. David told jo, Joab, Joab, to kill, to, to take the letter, no, to kill Uriah. And Uriah took the letter to Joab, not even knowing that he was about to get killed. He wasn't going to never get back to Bathsheba. So he ain't going to never know. And to this day, he don't know that Bathsheba had a baby by David. So that was done in secret. But God said, for thou did it, it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the sun. Everybody in the whole world, wide world, knew King David. And everybody in the whole wide world going to know that King David wives are sleeping with King Jabagod and Jubadah and all these other people. I'm making up names because these names back in the day was crazy. But I can't, I couldn't pronounce it. I ain't going to say it was crazy. And I'm not saying that those are the, those are the, the women, I mean the men that David wives slept with. I'm just making up names but I'm, as a point. Okay. Now David confesses his guilt. Still in 2 Samuel 12 and 13 verse. And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. See, this is why David was a man after God's own heart. And even though he did what he did, in the long run, he had to pay consequences. But God did forgive him. Let's read on and let's see if God forgave him. And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the, against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, What? Okay, so let's go on. All right. The Lord. Okay, now, now, now check this out. I have sinned against thee. Now look what David, look what Nathan said, that the Lord said. And Nathan said unto David, the Lord also have put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die. So even though David did what he did, God forgave him. And he's not going to die for the sin that he committed. It. But he's going to suffer the consequences behind it. All these things is going to happen to him. Because of his sneakiness. Because of his undermining things that he thought God didn't know and see. When he's the one who chose him. How dare you think you can outsmart God. Because you dislike this person. You're going to be in a in the background scheming stuff and making it seem like somebody else is doing it when all along it's you. 
and make the person that you're scheming against think is is Jack be nipple when it's Jack be quick. So now you got this person disliking Jack be nipple so that you can always say, look, she ain't serving. He or she ain't serving God because look how she hating Jack be nipple. When all along, you know, it's Jack be quick that's doing it. So it's making that person look bad by feeling away against Jack B. Nipple. So it's like tenting their salvation. But God know the real deal. And God ain't going to hold it on the person for having some kind of feeling against Jack B. Nipple. Because they don't know. But he going to sure enough take it out of your hide. Because he know that you know that you messing around with Jack B. Quick. And you got Jack B. Quick doing the devil, man. And you got Jack B. Nipple going through the consequences. So you going to have to take on... That person is going to have to take on all the sins, all the problems, all the consequences of Jack B. Nipple and Jack B. Quick. Because they the one that's, that started it. Now, because Jack B. Nipple and Jack B. Quick. No, because Jack B. Nipple don't really know what's happening. They have a lesser sentence. sentence. But Jack B. Quick know really what's going on. Lord have mercy. So Jack be quick going going get some bad suffering happening. Don't mess with me. I ain't don't come with me with this food. Boy, I'm taking it to heart now. Okay. Okay. Here we go. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die. How be it? But because by this deed. Thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. The child also that is born unto thee shall die. See what it says? Because by this deed thou hast given great occasion. Now you have opened up a door where people can people think they can do this thing. Because the king did it. Because I guess back then, whatever the king did... Everybody else could do well. The king do it. The king do it. The king do it. That's how people have a congregation following after pastor, the bishop, or the elder. Because they up there doing all the devil, man. The con the congregation see them doing it. They 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 like Jack B. Nipple. They don't really know what's happening. But because they only seeing they at the surface surface only seeing the surface so we're gonna go along with it we're gonna do what they say because it's the right thing to do because they're using god to do it but then pastors bishops deacon elders evangelists is wrong that's why i'm trying i i have always done and will always do preach the truth be truthful let people Never speak to me because I told the truth. It doesn't matter to me. Because my Bible tells me, and ye shall know the truth. So when I get to know the truth, it's going to make me free. And it sure did. It made me free. Uh, no matter how much people is mad with me, angry with me, you know, I can't do this. I can't do that. I can't be a part of this. I can't be a part of that. that, 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 that. It don't make me no different. Because that give me more time to serve my God. Oh, I want to sing your praises every night and every day. I want to serve you, Lord, my Whole life through, God, you're so good to me. You're really, really good to me. I want to spread it throughout eternity. Oh, oh you're good. Oh, oh. I want to sing your praise all night long and every day. I'll stand and worship you my whole life through. She's another one. I forgot the words. It's just coming to me. Hey, I 
want to sing your praise all night long and every day i'll stand and worship you my whole life through god you're so good to me you've been so good to me i shouted through eternity god you're so good all right all right all right, all right. that song's like in my spirit and saying okay the child should die so right so that that child died okay and nathan departed unto his house and the lord struck the child that uriah's wife bared unto david and it was very sick you notice they said uriah's wife they didn't even say david's wife david therefore besought god for the child and david fasted and went in and laid all night upon the earth and the elders of his house arose and went to him to raise him up from the earth but he would not neither did he eat bread with them he really went in a deep fast i don't know what for because God already said, well, I guess you can change God's mind. You know, I guess you can. I guess you can. So I'm not going to say you can. Because Hezekiah did. You know. Okay. And the elders, da, 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 da. and it came to pass on the seventh day that the child died. And the servants of David feared to tell him that the child was dead. But they said, Behold, while the child was yet alive, we spake unto him, and he would not hearken unto our voice. How would he then vex himself if we tell him that the child is dead? So that means that when the child was still alive, he was still praying and stuff. I don't know. It didn't so much say that the son was wrong with the child, right? Oh, it's saying the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bared unto David, and it was very sick. Oh, wow, I passed that. I did pass that, and he departed unto his house, and the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bare unto David. And okay, so that's what went down. He, okay, but anyway. Behold, while the child was yet alive, he spake. Okay. And when David saw that his servants whispered, David perceived that the child was dead. Therefore, David said unto his servants, Is the child dead? And they said, He is dead. Then David arose, check this out. David arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself and changed his apparel and came into the house of the Lord and worshiped. Then he came to his own house and when he required, they set bread before him and he did eat. Then said his, then said his servants unto him, what thing is this that thou hast done? Thou didst fast and weep for the child while it was alive. But when the child was dead, thou didst rise and eat bread. It's not a question, so let me not say this. Thou rise, thou didst rise and eat bread. And he said, while the child was yet alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, who can tell whether God will be gracious to me that the child may live? Okay, so there you go. That's why I did it. Even though he was told that God was going to kill the child. But he didn't take it upon himself to say, oh, well, you're going to kill him, so let me just leave it alone. He, I guess he did want the child to live, so he went to God anyway, fasting and praying, hoping that that would change his mind. But what's the name? Nariah said to him, Uriah said to him, not Uriah, Nathan said to him, how bid it because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. He opened up the door where people could blaspheme against God for allowing David to get away with committing adultery and killing somebody. The child also that is born unto thee shall die. Shall surely die. So he had done told him. Who is to say, who can tell whether God will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now he is dead. Wherefore should I fast? Can I bring him back again? David crazy. I shall go to him and he shall not return to me. And David comforted Beth, Bathsheba, his wife, now the same, and went in unto her and laid with her. And she bears his sin. So they had 
sexual intercourse again. Y'all go with your bad self. I love how they put it. Lay with her. And the Lord loved him. And he called his name Solomon. And the Lord loved him. Solomon got a, got a, got a chapter. Solomon. This Song of Solomon. That's David's son. And he sent by the hand of Nathan the prophet. And he called his name Jadiga because of the Lord. Okay. So, that just, let me see. Let me go to the footnotes on this. Let's go back to, let me see. Let me see. Okay. Now we're going to do the footnotes. Okay, so let me go back. This one in my okay. I I gotta go all the way back to when I first. I should have read it while I was doing. Okay, hang on. Okay, here we go. Now, this is the footnote, starting from 2 Samuel 11 and 3rd verse. As David looked from the roof of the palace, he saw a beautiful woman bathing, and he was filled with lust. David should have left the roof and fled the temptation. Instead, he entertained the temptation by inquiring about Bathsheba. The results was devastating. To flee temptation, one, Ask God in earnest prayer to help you stay away from people, places, and situations that may tempt you. Two, memorize and meditate on portions of scripture that compact your specific weaknesses. At the roof of most temptation is a real need or desire that God can fill, but we must trust in his timing. Three, find another believer, which is hard to find, with whom you can openly share your struggles and call this person for help when temptation strikes. 11.4. That Bathsheba was purified from her uncleanliness means that she had just completed the purification rites following ministration. Remember I said seven days before and seven days after you can get pregnant. Thus, she could not have already been pregnant by her own husband. Oh, that's why they was emphasizing that as well. They was letting us know that she wasn't pregnant by her husband. Because she had just seven days before going to bed with, with David. And seven days after from having, she went in seven days afterwards. But seven days before that. She wasn't with her husband because her husband was at war, as we read. Okay. All right. Thus, she could not have already been pregnant by her own husband when David slept with her. Le Leviticus 15 and 19 to 30 gives more information on the purification rites that Sheba had to perform. Okay. Okay. As if a woman have an issue of blood. This is the Leviticus 15. This is talking about the purification that Bathsheba had to go through. Right? So, and if a woman have an issue and her issue in her flesh be blood, she shall be put apart seven days. That's the menstrual cycle. Seven days. And whosoever touch her shall be unclean until the evening. And, and that's why... Uriah probably didn't go in because he knew what was going on with her, with his wife. Okay, and whosoever touch her shall be unclean until the evening. And everything that she lieth upon in her separation shall be unclean. Everything also that she sitteth upon shall be unclean. And whosoever touches her bed shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening. I guess until she finished. And whosoever touches 
Anything that she sat upon shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening. And if it be on her bed or on anything whereon she sitteth, when he touches it, he shall be unclean until the evening. Not evening, even, E-V-E-N. And if any man lie with her at all, and her flowers be upon him, you see what they call? They call her flowers. They call the menstrual cycle back there flowers. I called it grandma. I called it my grandma. That's what my grandma called it, so I called it that. And I'm here to tell you that she went by this ritual. When I would get my menstrual cycle, I had to sit down. I couldn't move around a lot. Right? I don't even think it was too much bathing. I just washed myself. I couldn't get in water, like take a, a bath and stuff like that. Because she said that it wasn't good because you're over, a woman is open and the water goes up in there. And you know, after the eggs is released and you finish your menstrual cycle, that part of your body closed back up. So your uterus opens to a certain extent to, when you think about it. Your uterus opens up to a certain extent. And then once all that is done, then it closed back up and it goes back to normal. And it waits until that 28th or that 23rd day or however it is. And then it begins to, that's why the woman goes through so much. Some people get very, some women get very moody. Some, some women get very sexually active and stuff. But that's why it says here that they can't touch nobody. But if they do touch anybody, they're considered unclean and they have to wait till the evening. Okay. And if a man lie with her at all and her flowers be upon him, he shall be unclean seven days. So they said until even. So that means until the end of that day. When they say, and bathe himself in water and be clean until the even. So the even is, I guess, the end of the day. But here they say, if somebody, if a man lie with her at all and her flowers, if she going through her menstrual cycle, be upon him. Wow, so that means if it's on him. Hey, this is deep. I tell you, learn so you can learn a lot from the Bible. He shall be unclean for seven days. And that's normal how that's normally how long the woman keep her cycle for seven days. Some people may go eight, some people may go ten, some people may go four or five. But I guess the the natural and the normal length of time is seven days. So he says he shall be clean. For seven days, but that's only the man that had sexual intercourse with that woman while she was pregnant. It's a difference. In other words, they're saying it's different from you just lying in the bed or lying on the bed that she had her menstrual cycle. It could not be no blood or nothing there. She could not be touching him. Or she could have her sitting down in the chair. Ain't nothing came through, but they considered it unclean. God was no joke. He wants you to be completely clean. Unfortunately, that's something that, that was put upon Eve, you know, for her sinning. But, you know, that's a part of life now. So it's not so much as being nasty. But back then, it was considered to God to be unclean. Okay, so if he had sexual intercourse while she had her period, then he was unclean for seven days and the bed wherein he lied is unclean for seven days. Shall be unclean. And if a woman have an issue of her blood many days out of the time of her separation, or if it run beyond the time of her separation, that's the woman with the issue of blood, all the days of the issue of her unclean shall be as the days of her separation. She shall be unclean. So that's where... The story in the Bible with the woman with the issue of blood, that's the issue of the blood. I don't know whether people knew what the issue of the blood is, but I'm here to tell you the issue of the blood that she had was a flow. Her menstrual cycle never stopped. It kept going. And that was considered weird. But here's the crazy thing about it. As long as it was lasting, she didn't consider she wasn't considered losing blood. So that means she could I guess could never have kids because the eggs never had time to really develop and be fertile because she just kept bleeding. So if she had, let's, let's just hypothetically say a woman in general creates, the body creates, I, I never really asked that. I wonder if society know that. 
but um, I, 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 I should I say scientists? But let's just say hypothetically speaking that a woman generates 120 eggs. 365 days a year. So we would calculate 120 eggs, right? Times a year. A year is 12 months, right? So let's see how many eggs, just hypothetically speaking, that the woman will generate. Okay, here we go. Okay, so let's say she generates 120 eggs, right? A month, because she got to bleed a month. So we'll take the 120 eggs and we'll, let's say, times it by 30. That's 3,600 that's 3,600 eggs. 20 eggs a month. Okay, so no, I calculate wrong. 120 eggs she produced each month. Right? So we take that 120 eggs and we times that by 12. Wait, 120 eggs times that by 12, which is a year, because it's 12 months in a year. And that's 1,440 eggs she makes a year. So if she been going for 36 years, let's say, I can't remember how long she had the issue of blood right off the top of my head. But let's say it was 36 years. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm going to give her last year. I'm, let's say it was 12 years, right? So she been bleeding out 1,440 eggs a year. And it's 12, 12 years, so we're going to times that by 12. And 17,200, if my calculations is right, I'm not a mathematician. 7,280 eggs for 12 years. So that's how long she's been ble bleeding. So it's, it's never stopping. So let's go. And if a woman has an issue of blood many days, okay, every bed we're in, okay, and if a woman have an issue of, of her blood many days out of the time of her separation, or if it run beyond the time of her separation, all the days of the issue of her uncleanness shall be as the days of her separation, and she shall be unclean. So she's bleeding as long as she's supposed to be separated. So she's supposed to be separated for seven days. So she's bleeding for seven days. Beyond that seven days, let's put it that. If she, if it run beyond the time of her separation, which is seven days, all the days of the issue of her uncleanness shall be as the days. Lord have mercy. So we 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 can kind of gasp and understand what that woman with the issue of blood was going through. Nobody want to touch it. Nobody want to be be around her. I did a message on her, and I kind of like the Lord kind of like brought out you know, what she actually was going through. And whosoever touches those things shall be unclean and shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in the water and be unclean until the evening, which is the end of that day. I'm saying, I don't know. But if she be cleansed of her issue, then she shall number to herself seven days. And after that, she shall be clean. So if she only go to seven days, then it's only seven days. But if she go beyond the seven days, then she got to go to seven days and the, ex, the next seven days, that's 14. As long as she keep bleeding, that's seven, 14, seven, 14, 21 days and it keeps going on and on and on. And on the eighth day, she shall take unto her two turtles or two. So this is what Bathsheba had to do. So this is why they say the ritual. Let, let me go back to that. They say, and the woman conceived and sent and told, no, wait a minute. Thus she could not have already been pregnant by her own husband when David slept with her. And then they say Leviticus 15, 19, 30 gives more information on the purification rites that she had to perform. So this is what she had to perform before she actually got in the bed with her husband. Even though that was her husband, she was considered clean, unclean for seven days. 
So this is what she had to do. She had to, hold on. On the eighth day, after the seventh day, that she's no longer unclean. On the eighth day, she shall take unto her two turtles or two young pigeons. And the same pigeon we see flying around here. And bring them unto the priests, to the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And the priest shall offer the one for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering. And the priest shall make an atonement for her before the Lord for the issue of her uncleanliness. So do you see the ministerial cycle? I guess it's not so great after all. I mean, in reality, any woman that gets her period or her menstrual cycle is capable of having a baby. You see? That proves, let me put it that way, that proves that the woman can have a baby because you ain't going to menstrual cycle nothing out of you if nothing is up there. So you got some eggs up there and them eggs got to get out your body. Just like I said earlier, they can't sit up in there. You probably have some problems with you. Okay. Okay, so we we we'll leave that. So let's go on. Let me go on with the notes. Okay. Now eleven fifteen, which should okay. David put both Bathsheba and Joab in difficult situation. Bathsheba knew it was wrong to commit adultery. Okay, but to refuse a king's request could mean punishment or death. That's what I said. Okay, Joab did not know why Uriah, Uriah had to die, but it was obvious the king wanted him killed. We sometimes face situations with only two apparent choices, and both seem wrong. When that happens, we must not lose sight of what God wants. So no matter what people, the government people is doing, it could be, it could be something that the bishop, the pastor, the elder, the evangelist, or the minister say to do but if you know that god would not want you to do it and it's going against god it doesn't matter who it is that's telling you to do it you shouldn't do it now let's see what it says in the footnote should or should we not do it okay we some we sometimes face situations with only two apparent choices and both seem wrong when that happens we must not lose sight of what god wants the answer may be to seek out more choices. Wow, that's something to think about. You always be presented with two. I only got two choices. Maybe there's more choices. You got to seek it out. Mm, that's, a, that's a good one. I got that one, all right? By doing this, we are likely to find a choice that honors God. So that's what I do when I'm told to do something. And I feel it's wrong. And I know it's wrong. I say, Lord. I said, you got to give me the choice. You got to fix this. I don't want to be disobedient to my leaders. And I don't want to be disobedient to you. So you got to tell me what to do. You got to work this out. And God will come in and work it out where my leaders won't be mad with me. And if they mad, that's just on them. But it won't be because of the situation. Because God will fix that situation, turn that situation around. Where it'll, it'll, in a sense, backfire on them. And there, it'll be in their face where, oh, it's, she shouldn't do that. And if she go on and do it, it's going to make me look bad. But it's really God not look, it's really not making God look bad. Not so much as them not looking bad. Because who cares whether you look bad or not? It's all about pleasing God. Okay, so let's go on. All right, so the answer, right. Find a choice. Okay. Uriah and several other soldiers died as a result of David's scam. Sin often hurts innocent bystanders. When you are tempted to do wrong, thinking about the people who could be hurt by your sin may motivate you to avoid it. That's the truth. That's why I always do right. Try my best to do right because I don't want to hurt nobody. I think about other people's feelings. And if I do this, it's going to affect the next person some way, somehow. And they could or could not be related to me, but it will still affect them. So I'm not going to do it. Because what I do, I want it to affect the next person positively, not negatively. Okay. 
Okay. 1125. David's response to Uriah's death seemed flamboyant and insensitive. Right? Remember I said he just said go and tell the people. Go back and tell them that. Um, that they may. They got to find a new. Wait. Let me go back. See it's going to change. 10. 13. 16. 25 days. When David was telling them to, um, remember I said that, wow, he ain't got no. Okay, when David said unto the messenger, Thus said thou, say unto Joab, Let not this thing displease thee, for the sword devoured one as well as another. Make thy battle more strong against the city and overthrow it, and encourage thou him. Okay. So that's why he say David responds to Uriah's death seemed flippant and insensitive. While he grieved deeply for Saul and Abner, his his rivals, chapters one, three, verses three, thirty-one to thirty-nine. Chapters one and three, verses thirty-one to thirty-nine. He showed no grief for Uriah, so he cared more about Saul and Abner his rivals, than he did for Uriah, a good man with strong spiritual character. You see what happened? That's why he felt like he could go and take Bathsheba. Because once he found out that it was Uriah's wife, oh, he, he, David knew he was a good man, Uriah, and he probably knew that Uriah stood up for right. Even though he was fighting the war, he stood up for right. And it kind of like brought something out of David that David did not want to see. And a lot of times people don't like people when people life brings them out, condemns them. So now you, he wanted to sit back and, and plot to kill him so that, you know, hey, he ain't nobody important. Even though deep down in the back of David's mind, he knew Uriah was somebody important. Because it say here, why he he showed no grief for Uriah, a good man with strong spiritual character. Why? David had become callous to his own sin. The only way he could cover up his first sin, adultery, was to sin again. And soon he no longer felt guilty for what he had done. Feelings is not reliable guides for determining right and wrong. Deliberate, deliberate. Repeated sinning had dulled David's sensitivity to God's laws and others' rights. The more you try to cover up a sin, the more insensitive you become towards it. Don't become hardened to sin as David did. Confess your wrong actions to God before you forget they are sins. Amen, amen, amen. King David abused his position of authority to get what he wanted. Just like I said, because he was a king, he went out there and took Bathsheba. Today, we often see abuse of power in government and businesses and churches. Jane, put that down here. God is especially hard on leaders who misuse their position to exploit, exploit, ex, exploit, exploit it, exploit it manipulate or compromise those under their authority. This breaks the trust between them and those they serve. See, people don't believe that. Now, I don't know about the government when they say, I don't know about government and businesses, but I know how it is in church. When people use their authority to the congregation, the congregation, they compromise. Okay, it says here, 
misuse their position to exploit, exploit it, manipulate, or compromise those under their, their authorities. This breaks the trust. See, they, some leaders don't believe that. They think that, oh, their congregation is supposed to be this way towards them at all times. They missing the point that because of how they treated the people, the people ain't too keen on listening to them. And then they want to sit up there hitting their head. I just don't understand why the people don't want to do, why they don't want to listen, why they want to do this, why they don't want to do this, why they don't want to do that. Because you don't manipulate them so long that they didn't see God in you and they definitely don't see it now. So why they want to, they want to follow God. They don't see God in you, so they ain't going to follow you. So wonder why they ain't following you. Better check yourself and see if you following God. Okay, let's go on. Okay, as a prophet, Nathan was required to confront sin. See, that's what people are. They don't want you to confront sin. They want you to go along with the sin. If, if, if whoever it is, whoever's coming through, you just mind your business and act like you don't see nothing. No, I'm not doing that because I'm not being responsible. I'm not going to hold a responsibility for your sin. And then I got to be accountable for it. No, I got my own life to be accountable for. I got to live the life so that I can get to heaven. You ain't getting there. You ain't think about getting there. You, you compromising things. No, you're not going to stop me from getting. No, 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 no. Say in my father's house are many mansions. He said, I'll go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there ye may be also. That's where I'm trying to get. So I'm not going to let you cause me to compromise my salvation because you want to do some devilment. Go get your click and do it with them. I'm not a part of this click. That's why I like to be by myself. That's why I'm by myself. Because I'm not going to be caught up in people clicks and foolishness. Okay. Okay. As a prophet, Nathan was required to confront sin. Even the sin of a king. People feel like you ain't got no business talking about. Oh, you're not supposed to say that to them. Who is them? Just because they have a title, that, that title don't mean nothing to God. When God say you wrong and you did something wrong and he sends a prophet to tell you, he's going to prepare you to tell the prophet and he's going to prepare the prophet to receive it. Now, what the prophet do with it, that's between the prophet and God. You see what I'm saying? But it's mainly up to the prophet because God done did his job. He done let you see where you was wrong at. So it's up to you to get it right. So you as a leader, God send you, send somebody to you in reference to some things to get right. Don't be looking at the person like, who you think you is? Who is you to rap a man me? <laughs> People crazy. They really, they really get in these positions where they feel like they can't be touched. What, what do they think? What do they think? Can't touch this? Mm. Okay. It took great coverage, skill, and tact. To speak to David in a way that will make him aware of his wrong actions. See, and that skill comes from the Holy Ghost. When God sends you to tell a, a preacher, a bishop, a pastor, whoever it may be in leadership over you. When God wants you to go and tell them, he will prepare you, give you the words to say that that person, when it get to them and they hear it in their ears, they can't say it ain't God. Okay, let me see. Let me check the speech today in the way that we can. When you have to confront someone with unpleasant news, pray for coverage, skill, and tact. If you want that person to respond constructively. Think through what you are going to say. How you present your message may be as important as what you say. Season your words with wisdom. It was a year later. And by then, now we at still second Sam. Oh, we in second Samuel 12 in the fifth.
Okay, it was a year later. Oh, so this is a year after he done confronted Bathsheba and Bathsheba's pregnant, saying David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, as the Lord lived the man. Okay, yeah, this is a, no, this is a year later after all this took place. And now he done married Bathsheba. Okay, just a year later, he done went and married this woman. He couldn't even let the girl grieve her husband. It was a year later, and by then David had become so insensitive to his own sins that he didn't realize he was the villain in Nathan's story. The qualities we condemn in others are often our own character flaws, mm -hmm. which, which friends, associates, or family members which friends, associates, or family members do you find easy to criticize and hard to accept? See, this, this is where, this is where I am. This is how I know that grown in God because I ain't criticizing nobody. God has allowed me over these few years before Pastor Glover died and more so now that she's dead and gone for good, for life, forever. I'm never going to see her again. I'll never be able to text her again. I never be able to ask her any type of advice, which I did at times. My eyes are now open to see more and more so who God is. To see more so in how not to criticize people. Not to say she did it, but I'm, I'm saying this, this, these are the things that have opened up to me. Not to be so quick to criticize people for the things that they do, the clothes they wear, how they look. Because things can happen so quickly where you wake up one morning and you don't even, you can't even identify yourself. Oh, I have mercy. He, he just opened up my understanding of life. Spiritually and naturally. Okay, let me go on. Let me hurry. This is like an hour and 32 minutes. Okay. It's really important that I get this out. I really hope people actually watch this video to the end but if you don't if you got this far i appreciate it click the like button if you got this far click the like button my dear and comment and tell me what you think about this video because you got to one hour you went through the whole hour i appreciate you and i love you i love you i love you with god's love okay the qualities we condemn me which friends associates and family members do you find easy to criticize or hard to accept instead of trying to change them Ask God to help you understand. Lord, have mercy. I thank you. I thank you. Let me finish reading that. Instead of, instead of trying to change them, ask God to help you understand their feelings and see your own flaws. Yes, 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 yes. That's what I do. I say, Lord, and I still pray that prayer. Lord, help me to understand how they're feeling so that I'll be able to help them as well as help myself. I'm trying to see, okay. Oh, it's right. It's a long show, okay. All right. Help yourself, right? Understand their feelings and see your own flaws more clearly. You may discover that in condemning others, you have been condemning yourself. That's so true. I learned all that. Okay, we now 12, 10, still in 2 Samuel 12, 10 verse to the 14th verse. The prediction, this is, I'm, I'm reading the footnotes. The predictions in this, okay. The prediction in these verses came true because David's murder came true. Because David's mur murdered Uriah and stole his wife, one, murder was a constant threat in his family. Two, his household rebelled against him. Three, his wives was given to other to another in public view. Four, his first child by Bathsheba died. If David had known the painful consequences of his sin, he might not have pursued the pleasure of the moment. Be careful who you go sleep with for the moment. Be careful who you want to flirt with because the woman look good or the man look good for a moment. Because when that moment is dead and over with, you stuck with it. 
You stuck with what you did. Okay, let's see. 12 and 13. During this incident, David wrote Psalms 51, giving valuable insight into his character and offering hope for us as well. No matter how miserable guilt makes you feel or how terrible you have terribly you have sinned, you can pour out your heart to God and seek his forgiveness as David did. There is forgiveness for us when we sin. David also wrote Psalms 32 to express the joy he felt after he was forgiven. So you can look at those. You can read those. Psalms 51 is when he was going, giving value. When he was going through what he was going through, that's when he wrote Psalms. And you can get insight about his character. And Psalms 32 is how he felt after he was forgiven. 12, 14, David confessed and repented of his sins. That's in the same chapter, 12, 13. But God's judgment was that, the, that his child would die. The consequences of David's sin were irreversible. Sometimes their apology isn't enough. You see what I'm saying? People are so quick to say, I'm sorry. Or maybe not so quick. But we got some people that be quick to say, I'm sorry. No, they doing devilment. No, they sat down and planned that devilment. And in the plan, they say, oh, I'm just going to say sorry, but I done got my point of court. I done hurt them. I done made them cry. Oh, I'm sorry. The person's crying and boo-hoo. I'm sorry. But you done did the damage already. You done said what you said to the person. Now the person's hurt. Now the person got to live with that for the rest of their life unless God take it out of them. And people want to say, you got to let go of this hurt and give it this shut up and sit down because you still got hurt. That's why you keep talking about it. Lord, help me, help me, Lord. I'm just reading your word, Lord. I'm just reading your word. <laughs> I'm reading the footnotes of your word, Lord. Okay. All right. Okay. It say, but God's judgment. All right, all right. Sometimes apology isn't enough. When God forgives us. Oh, wait, let me go back. The consequences to what David did and his son died, or uh, child died. The consequences of David's sin was irre irreversible. So even though a person come and say, sorry, what you did, you can't reverse it back. What you said, you can't reverse it back. But if it's something that you did and you know you did and God brought it to your attention that you did, don't try to make the person feel bad because it's your sin. It ain't this. Okay. When God, sometimes apology isn't enough. When God forgives us and restores our relationship with him, he doesn't eliminate all the consequences of our wrongdoing. We may be tempted to say, if this is wrong, I can always apologize to God. Just like I say, oh, all right, I'm going to go over here and I'm going to do this and I'm going to plan this. And all I got to do is just say, I'm sorry, Lord. Forgive me, Lord. That's what people would say. Oh, he, um, he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So you just got to go and repent. I repent every day. No, I don't. I don't repent every day because I don't do no devil man every day where I got to keep going to God, ask to God, Lord, forgive me. I'm sorry I didn't mean to do that. I know it was wrong, but I didn't mean to do that, Lord, please. Please! You busy telling your child, do not go in my pocketbook and take no money. And every single day your child going in that pocketbook take that money. Even though you done gave him $20, he going to come back and take 50 and you know it's him because you don't you and him, him, him and her in the house. You, him, or her in the house. And then you catch him. Not catch him, but you you go and you confirm. I know you took didn't you take it yet. I'm sorry, mommy. All right, all right, I forgive you. Next day you do come on, come on. Well, I'm supposed to keep living leave my pocketbook there. I'm either gonna leave my pocketbook there and 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 come out and come up with with some kind of a uh, 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 strategy to keep you from going in there. Or I'm just going to move my pocketbook and lock it up. One of the two, right? Excuse me. Whichever one works better for the individual. Okay. He doesn't eliminate all the If this is wrong, okay. He doesn't eliminate all the consequences of our own door. We may be tempted to say, if this is wrong, I can always apologize to God. I don't ever be tempted. But we must remember that 
<clears throat> that we may set into motion events with irres irreversible consequences. Yes. You may be doing things and go out and say, oh, I can go to God and ask for forgiveness. And you go ask for forgiveness. And it maybe ain't that bad or that deep. I mean, sin is sin. But maybe not bad that that deep where you infect and hurt somebody else. You just hurt it yourself. So you got past it. You got through it. You all right. You ain't got no consequences. But then you start doing things to hurt other people. But you involved. Now, instead of you just staying in your own devil, man, and doing your own devil, man, by your own devilish self, you want to go and add other people in it. Now, that's irreversible because now you draw the other person in. Now, the other person get caught up in something. If it's a church matter, now they sat down. They can't preach no more. They can't do this no more because now the whole world saw what they did, but it was all based on you. You the one who pushed that person to do it. But you, they don't see you because you're the big person. They only see that person over there. So now their, 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 their name is Tanty. They walk in God is messed up because of your foolishness. So that can't be reversed now. So the only way it can be fixed is for God to come in and soothe it out and smooth it out and remove it. He's the one that deal with people's mind. So he's going to take it out of their mind. They don't remember what you did. But you that started the foolishness will always remember because you got to suffer the consequences. So he's saying, say, I can always apologize to God. You may be tempted to say, but you must remember that some of those motions that you put in effect will and can be irreversible consequences okay 12 14 why did this child have to die this was not a judgment on the child for being conceived out of wedlock that's what wedlock means outside of marriage so now a lot of times people you know look at children being born out of a bad situation even with abortion. Let's talk about abortion a little bit. A child being born out of a situation that was not godly, that God was against. So rape is against God. Incest is against God. So in the Bible, there is scenarios and stories in the Bible where God told people to stone everybody in the family, down to the children. I give you a story. Can't remember right now where it's located at, but it had to do with one of the prophets, and the prophet was over. Was it the prophet? No, I think it's the king. He was over the tribes of Israel, right? And they went and won this war in this particular town. And God told that king to don't take nothing out of that town. Everybody, y'all don't won the war. So now just take the people, the children of Israel, and leave out of there and go. One particular person went and took something. And took it into their tribe and buried it in their backyard. I'm put it in that perspective. Now... The, the king not knowing, they went out to fight. But let's say they won that war. They came today. The person took that today, buried it today. Tomorrow, maybe a week later, they went to war. From that week on, for months, they kept losing. They kept losing. They was losing men, and they was losing the war. So this king, which was a servant of God, went to God. And ask God what was going on. I know y'all heard that phase that people want to say all the time. is sending the camp. Yes, it was. Sending the camp. So God didn't realize. I mean God. The king didn't realize what was going on. But God emphasized to go through, go to the different tribes. And have them take out whatever it was in their house. Right? Because somebody got sent in their camp. I believe God told them, I'm, I'm putting it in my thoughts, in my belief, in my memory, but I could be wrong. 
God let him know that somebody went and took up something from that camp that they wasn't supposed to take. And that's what's causing that's what's causing them to lose the war. But I don't believe God told them who it was, right? Until he went out there and confronted the people. And he had all they he went through all the tribes and the tribes came out with all their family. Nothing was in there. Finally they came to this particular tribe. And when they went to the tribe, he went and told, now this is just my story, my memory. So I might have it a little rubbish up, but it's in the Bible. And they went to that tribe and I'm not sure whether God told them that was a tribe or whether the king asked, all right, who was it? Somebody in here took up, they wasn't, whatever they say was gold, took up the gold and was supposed to take the gold and they got it in here. Came out that the person over that tribe stepped up and said, yes, I did. Uh, but I took it because of this reason, that reason, and other reason. And you know what God said? God told the king to take out everybody from out that house, stone them to death, down to the children. So people want to think, about, oh, God is not that cool. God ain't going to kill no children. Yes, he will. And not so much, as it's being explained here, not so much is because the child did something wrong, but because the sin was from within that family, the dad, it, that means it's going to pass on. So God was stopping that sin from going anywhere. So that's why I say people want to talk about uh, generation curses. No, there ain't no generation curses. That is sin. And God was stopping that sin. He told that king to burn wait a minute, wait a minute, to stone them to death and then burn their bodies so I want you to be fooled that God won't kill no kids I won't allow kids to be killed uh uh he loved children yes he do just like he loved you and me but we feel like we want to do what we want to do the kids want to do what they want to do don't think he going he going um he going to take care of them if they disobeying him, his, disobeying his laws, disobeying his parents, disobeying the lands of the, the laws of the land. Come on now. What kind of God do you think he is? He can't stand for righteousness. I mean, he can't stand for wrong. He only stands for righteousness. Okay, so let's go on. It say, why did the child die? This is the child of David, the first child that he made with Bathsheba. This was not a judgment on the child for being conceived out of wedlock. So don't be get, get that out your head. Oh, that child out of wedlock. I don't be bothered with Get it out your head. Because ain't nothing wrong with a child out of wedlock. These things happen. Okay. But a judgment on David, you see, that's the sins of the parents. Now, that child had to die because of David's sin, because of David's scheme. And that means that that child was going to carry David's devilness throughout his life. God said, no, no, no. We ain't bringing that in the world. We ain't bringing that. He already knows that it's going to be in the world anyway. But it ain't going to come from David. Not that child anyway. And even though the child was innocent. Right? He wasn't innocent. Because he was conceived in sin. He was conceived under a lie. He was conceived under lust. That that wasn't the way God wants kids to come into. So you lusting a woman, or you lusting a man, and you go have sex with him, and you be like, oh, I want this man, so I'm going to get pregnant by him. You're going to have so much problems with them children. Because of the simple fact, you want you wanted the child for the wrong reasons. And, and it's outside of God's jurisdiction. So he can't bless that urine, that un, un, union. He can't bless that un, union because it is, the thought of it was wrong. So that's what he say here. The, the judgment wasn't on the child being conceived out of wedlock, but the judgment was on David for his sin. David and Bathsheba deserved to die because they both knew they was wrong. But God looked at the reasons for these things. And David being a man, he got the 
the the the bad end of the stick. Bathsheba got some bad stuff too because she lost her first child. And I don't know what else she did, you know, because I don't think it say too much about Bathsheba. But they said that Bathsheba and David deserved to die, but God spared their lives and took the child instead. God still had work for David to do in building the kingdom. The child's death was a horrible punishment for David and Bathsheba to bear. It, all, it is also possible that the child lived it is also possible oh 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 i left out a word that was not that is the main event in this sentence it is also possible that had the child lived god's name would have been dishonored among israel pagan neighbors you see what i'm saying what would they have thought of a god who rewards murder. Didn't I say that earlier? Did not say that earlier. Did not say that earlier. That's the same thing I say about my life. The, the, the boyfriend I told you that got killed. That got shot in the head and died. And I was pregnant by him. He had to die. His child had to die. Because of the simple fact. What would they have thought of God. Who rewards me for having a baby out of wedlock. Nah, yeah, it was out of wedlock. Because I wasn't married to the guy. Due to sin committing a, a, a um, disobeying a commandment, which thou shalt commit idolatry, right? And then I have this child and me and the fathers together married. And then 10 years later, the original husband pops up. And we both are in the church. The father to the baby that I had and the wife, I mean the husband, to the, to the children that I got. What kind of foolishness is that? I'm preaching the word. See, God knew my life. He knew I was going to be a preacher. He knew I was going to be up there preaching his word. So in order for me to preach the word, I had to, I had to live it. I, I couldn't have nothing in my life that would be tainted. I'm up there preaching, talking about marriage. God smile on marriage. And and my husband there, and I'm married to somebody else. And I got a kid here, and a kid there, and a kid there. How many baby daddies I got? How many husbands I got? How many rings I got on my finger? So, just like I said here, what would they have thought? He said, God's name would have been dishonored. Nobody wouldn't have listened to nothing I said. All that that Bishop Mingo preached, all that that Mother Wilson taught and preached would have been down the drain because of my life, a grandchild that lived underneath them and still hanging on to their teaching. I would have tanned to their lives. Everybody would have forgot who Bishop Mingo was. Because Evangelist Jordan sitting up there with two husbands and, and ten kids. <laughs> this is why I love the Lord. He looked out for me. Because I wasn't even thinking that. Because I was about to marry the man. I was about to marry the man and everything else. God said, no, you're not. You ain't marrying nobody. You're already married. Say, thou shalt have one wife. You also become one. Okay, so let me go on. Okay, what would they have thought of God who rewards murder and adultery by giving a king a new heir? A baby's death is tragic, but despising God brings death to entire nations. While God readily forgave David's sin, he did not negate all its consequences. Nathan, a prophet of great wisdom, bravery, obedience, and loyalty, gave three crucial messages. Let me see. In David's life. One, he told David that his son will build a temple and that David's dynasty will last forever. Two, he confronted David with his sin of adultery. Three, he helped David place Solomon in the throne, on the throne. Second Samuel 12 and 20 to 24 verses. 
David did not continue to dwell on his sins. Play Solomon on the throne. David did not continue to dwell on his sin. He he returned to God, and God forgave him, open, opening the way to begin life anew. Even the name God gave Solomon, Jedidi, Jedida, because of the Lord, has a reminder of God's grace. When we return to God, accept his forgiveness, and change our ways. Okay, when we return to God, accept his forgiveness, and change our ways, he gives us a fresh start to feel forgiven as David did. Admit your sins to God and turn to him, then move ahead. Then move ahead with a new and fresh approach to life. Perhaps the best bit experience in life is the death of, one, of one's child. Perhaps the most bitter experience in life is the death of one's child. I know I lost a child. For comfort in such difficult circumstances, see Psalm 16, 9, and 11, 17 and 5, 139, Isaiah 4 and 11, 40 and 11. Solomon was the fourth son of David. I know we're going in. I want to make sure we're going to David. So that's uh, David. Okay. So this is 12 and 24. Okay. We're still in 12. All right. I think I read all the way. The end of 2012. Solomon was the fourth son of David. Fourth son. Okay. He had four sons. And Bathsheba. David and Bathsheba. First Chronicles 3 and 5. Therefore, several years passed between the death of their first child and Solomon's birth. Bathsheba may still have been grieving over the child's death. Amon's, Amnon's was encouraged by his cousin, Gen oh, to commit sexual sin. We may be more vulnerable to the advice of our relatives because we are close to them. However, we must make sure to evaluate every piece of advice by God's standards, even when it comes from relatives. Okay, so I didn't get it no more. So this must be, let me see. Okay. So they had, okay, so I only went as far as the 24th verse. And David com comforted that she and his wife and went in to her and laid with her. And bear his son, and also, and Jehab fought against Rahab. Okay, so Amon. Okay, so that's something different. All right, so that's that's the whole story of David. So, in my closing, God wants you to know that there's consequences for your sins, but don't sin because somebody wants you to sin because somebody think it's the best thing to do for you and because somebody don't like you. Remember that Jesus loves you. He don't like you. He loves you. And so do I. God bless you.